The more we learn about space, the more we become convinced that the Earth is perfectly reliable and comfortable for life. Its magnetic field, dense atmosphere with high oxygen content and the presence of water make it unique. There have been many random events on Earth that have made it so comfortable for humans. Take, for example, the tilt of the Earth's axis. The Earth is tilted by 23 degrees. If this angle were less, like Jupiter, there would be much less land suitable for agriculture on our planet. This is because the amount of heat received from the sun would be constant. The equator would become a hot desert, and the poles would become even colder. And the warm and cold air masses would be in a static state. Which would mean no seasons, no temperature and humidity variations, and therefore much less crops, this is only one of the factors. There are also atmospheric pressure, forests, sea currents, and many other key things for life that Earth has. One would be tempted to say that Earth is the most comfortable planet in the cosmos and it can't get any better, but what if it can? Math, physics, and astronomy are ruthless things. If only because these three sciences argue that it is possible for planets suitable for life to exist in space better than Earth. Earlier in 2014, Heller and John Armstrong even introduced the concept of a superorbiting planet. According to their definition, it is a planet or satellite whose characteristics allow it to support more diverse flora and fauna than Earth. But how is this possible? Well, for starters, it's worth taking a look not so much at the planet, but at the star, the Sun-typical main sequence class G yellow dwarfs. We are very grateful to our star for comfortable conditions for life, but still stars of this type are far from the best for life. This title is held by class K stars ideal nannies and caring luminaries for their planets. They are usually cooler than the Sun, but it's not about temperature. It's theoretically possible to live in a tiny brown dwarf. The only thing that depends on the temperature of the star is the radius of its habitable zone, and the highlight that makes a star ideal is its activity and lifespan. Our sun is a kind of compromise between huge and small. And hot and cold stars. But still, G-class stars are not the golden mean because they don't live that long. The sun is already 4 billion years old and she is gradually increasing in brightness. Somewhere in another billion years it will turn into a red giant and is guaranteed to destroy life on Earth. It is quite possible that it will return to a fully inhabited zone with liquid water for some time Mars, but even in an ideal arrangement its days will also be numbered quite quickly because of the expansion of the star. In dry terms, we have somewhere between 5 and 6 billion years, which a star like the Sun gives for life. At first glance this is a lot, but don't forget that it took evolution three and a half billion years for single-celled bacteria to evolve into humans. And after a billion the sun will kill those humans. This is where K-class stars enter the arena. They are calmer and live for about 40 or even 70 billion years, and hence hypothetical life around such stars will have much more time to develop without global cataclysms. This, by the way, is another disadvantage of G-class stars. Our sun is quite unstable, causing the Earth to be plagued by ice ages and global warming. Just a few tens of thousands of years ago, glaciers reached as far as central Germany. It's not hard to guess that the diversity of life has not been hindered. Life orbiting a K-class star will be better insured against the star's quarks, and it will be able to evolve over tens of billions of years, reaching incredible heights. What adds points to such stars is that there are many more of them in the universe. While stars like our Sun make up 6% of the total in the Milky Way, K-class stars make up 13%. And therefore, they have a higher chance of producing life. And let's talk about sizes. They matter in planetary science. If our Earth were 10 times larger, the pressure created by the liquid mantle would increase many times over and most likely the iron in the core would solidify. The magnetic field would vaporize along with it, and instead of polar lights we would see the faces of people dying from radiation. Added to that would be the constant bombardment of asteroids, which the fat planet would lure in by the pack. And at the same time volcanic activity, more mantle means more attempts to break through to the surface. 
It is difficult to build accurate models, but in general, scientists agree that life on such an Earth is likely, but not too diverse. After all, there's also gravity, which would make us all ten times heavier, and a host of other killer factors, the same can be said for a small Earth. You don't have to look very far for problems here. Less gravity means less force holding the atmosphere together. That's a problem even now. In 2009, NASA calculated the rate at which Venus, Mars, and Earth were losing atmospheres, and the surprise was that Earth was losing it the fastest. To be exact, about 90 tons of the substance is gone every day. Comparison with Mars is not particularly correct, because it is smaller and the main part has long lost, but the fact itself is clear. If the Earth is magically reduced, the atmosphere will be blown away very quickly and there will be no life to speak of. Still, there is a middle ground between the two extremes. A planet one and a half to two times heavier than Earth also boasts a couple of advantages. First, twice the gravity, which will make the atmosphere denser. This will automatically reduce the amount of solar radiation and lead to a couple of nice side effects like erosion and straightening of the topography. The depth of the oceans will decrease, and with it the diversity of marine life will increase. It's easier for them to live in shallow water. Tectonic activity will slightly increase, but it will be leveled by huge spaces for settlement. Now people in the Kareels have nowhere to go from their volcanoes. On a bigger planet. And even with shallow oceans, there would be enough land for everyone. And the land suitable for life because a dense atmosphere would increase the temperature on such a planet by 5 degrees. Coupled with plenty of oxygen for life, it's like paradise. True, it would have to adapt to gravity, and the trees are unlikely to be as tall. Still, according to scientists, the advantages of the planets are slightly greater than Earth. They outweigh their disadvantages. What else would make a hypothetical exoplanet better than Earth? a much larger number of continents. When Earth had only one Pangaea 300 million years ago, its center was a faintly green desert. After all, the farther away from the ocean, the drier it is. It was the same story with the other supercontinents. And now the center in Eurasia with the Gobi Desert and Africa with the Sahara cannot be called particularly inhabited. Resourcespace.com consulted with astrobiologists and every single one said that the more small continents, the better. They won't have parts far from the ocean, there will be plenty of currents on the planet, and the diversity of the living world will be key. Look at the same isolated Australia with its unique spiders and kangaroos. The way the world works is that the strongest survive, and the farther apart life is placed, the better chance weaker species have of surviving and evolving into something interesting. Anyway, as you can see, Man is such an ungrateful creature that he has devoted hundreds of scientific articles to the imperfections of the Earth instead of thanking us, and has also poured billions into finding a better planet. And the truth is, so far, it's been a mixed success. In 2020, Dirk Schultz released a high-profile article with a resounding headline about 24 planets that might turn out to be super-inhabitable, that is, possessing conditions better than Earth's. Unfortunately, upon detailed examination, it turned out that 23 of them did not meet the expected characteristics. Since then, we haven't made much progress in the search for habitable planets. More often than not, scientists use math, calculating orbits, planet masses, and hypothetical atmospheric composition. But as we've covered, life is a very fragile thing, and too much can go wrong. Proving the existence of a super-Earth requires ironclad facts, and at the moment one of the main candidates is Kepler-442b. This planet fills out almost all of the checklist scientists we've outlined. For one thing, it's in the habitable zone, around a K-class star that's 40% lighter than the Sun. But Kepler-442b is also closer to it. The planet has a year of only 112 days. True, Kepler-442b still receives somewhere around 30% less heat from its star than Earth, but that makes up for two notable details, Kepler-442b is 30% larger in radius, and about twice as heavy as Earth. Therefore, all the points about a dense atmosphere, shallow oceans, and plenty of room for life are fulfilled. 
The greenhouse effect of a dense atmosphere, in theory, would eliminate the difference in heat gained. Making Kepler 442 be one of the most promising candidates for life. True, the planet is 11206 light years away from Earth. In theory, James Webb's power should be enough to get a closer look at it, but even if the telescope finds something remarkable, with current advances in communications and spacecraft speeds, we won't be able to check it out anytime soon. The only good news is that a K type star will be alive much longer than Earth, and our descendants have plenty of time to spare. Also, one of the candidates for the presence of life is the system of the Star Trappist 1. In its habitable zone, there are as many as four planets, one of which has attracted the attention of scientists. Trappist 1e, a unique world in physical characteristics, maximally similar to Earth. The mass, radius, gravity, density, even temperature of the exoplanet are very similar to Earth's. The problem is that the star of this system is incredibly cold. Its mass is 10 times less than the solar mass, and hence the habitable zone is much closer to the star. A year on Trappist 1e lasts only six days, and its proximity to the luminary puts the planet at risk of constant bombardment by radiation. However, if by some miracle life learned to survive them, it could exist for billions of years, for brown dwarfs are insanely resilient, with lifespans even longer than those of K-class stars. It is not worth crossing Trappist-1 off the list of potentially habitable planets, especially since this world is only 40 light-years from Earth, and the James Webb Telescope will definitely have a field day in this system. The unfortunate truth is that our knowledge of life is far from perfect. We have created bombs capable of wiping out cities, but we can't even create the simplest single-cell life form. It's a mystery that has not yet been solved, and therefore any analysis of the planets is a priori meaningless. They are based only on our observations of the Earth, and space is infinite, and life may exist in it in forms we do not even suspect. Will scientists of our generation find life in space? Leave your opinion in the comments. Thank you for watching, dear friends. Your kind words and support motivate me to make more and more interesting videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to keep up to date with all future videos, because there are many more interesting and exciting things to come. See you on our space journey.